Hey, how's it going, everyone? My name is Derek Afasi. I'm the owner of Afasi Financial Group and RetireSharp.com. Today's topic, I want to discuss in detail what is a 770 account, and more importantly, when should a 770 account be utilized for an individual uh, retirement accumulation situation or retirement supplement situation, and then also when is it not necessary or um, where it could really blow up in someone's face. So I want to really dissect the pros and cons. Understand I'm going to be non-biased towards this, this type of account. This is a type of strategy that I leverage towards my own retirement planning, but that does not mean that this is going to be successful for your guys' retirement planning. It really just depends if you fall into you know a specific category, if you have a specific length of time before you're going to retire, and then what are the benefits. So I'm going to also show you how we design plans and how we could create more successful 770 plans or different things for you guys to be aware of on you know what makes a really good uh, a cash accumulation 7702 plan or 770 plan uh, as opposed to you know something that you're just paying for a type of uh, cost or a charge or an insurance related charge in there so you know when viewing this please have an open mind sometimes these things work really well and what I've seen majority of times is individuals will call into the agency, call into the office, and you know they're, they're, they're trying to be set up on these types of plans, and it just simply is not going to work. They either want to retire too soon, they're not allowing these accounts to accumulate as, as uh, you know, long as they should be, um, and there's, there's some risks involved where they would be better off just going with a more traditional retirement plan, such as like a Roth IRA or um, you know, just a traditional 401k. So... I want to make sure to you know get that up front in the uh, in the beginning because you know the things I'm going to talk about are definitely good things about this, but um, you know understand that there are very common traps with this. So just always be wary and always be mindful, and uh, you know hopefully this could help uh, further educate you on the topic. So this is just a type of marketing name first and foremost. Seven seven zero account or seven seven zero account. What it's basing it off of is you have a lot of insurance agents that what they're doing is they're honing in on Internal Revenue Code 7702 regarding the different tax benefits within a permanent life insurance policy. And when structured the proper way, which is really important to understand because you have to structure it the proper way, there's a way that you could leverage max cash value within that plan. And this cash value could be utilized as a retirement supplement for your later years when you're looking to retire, whether that's before age 59 and a half or after age 59 and a half. There's th different things that you could do to make contributions into these types of plans when they're structured properly, maximize out the cash value. And the ultimate results when done properly is you could accumulate those dollars. Those dollars could accumulate tax-free. You could pull those monies out tax-free so you could receive tax-free income and then the third level of importance will also be a tax-free death benefit so these are the benefits of this type of plan and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean by like how a traditional permanent life insurance policy works then what typical advisors do or typical agents do um, to max fund a cash value plan and then what we do differently in our office to try to make sure that we're squeezing out even more leverage and why we've been very successful on a national basis of offering these types of plans only when the situation works for that for that individual so typically whenever somebody's looking to utilize dollars to save for retirement they're known as in their accumulation phase they're trying to accumulate their dollars as much as possible. If they went and someone took a thousand dollars a month and was throwing it underneath their mattress, and you know they're they're doing that, you know they're placing away you know, twelve thousand dollars a year for ten years. They understand when they look underneath their mattress, they'll have one hundred twenty thousand dollars that's sitting there. So that's a type of savings component. Well, rather than just randomly throwing dollars under your mattress or throwing it to your savings account. What you lose to is something known as inflationary risk and purchasing power risk and different things to that is essentially an invisible uh, negative or invisible pressure that's going against those types of savings accounts. So 
rather than just say, okay, I'm just going to hoard my dollars, never receive a gain, an additional gain on those monies, never receive a loss on those monies. I just want to be able to touch it and, and feel it and you know, never have any sorts of increases. That could end up hurting that person later on. So this is where when someone's in their accumulation phase, they like to place their dollars into something and also get a rate of return linked to that type of account. So you think about this and it's in the form of a bucket when someone's trying to set up like a retirement account or an accumulation related account, they want to put contributions into a type of bucket and then they want to also make sure that they have a rate of return associated with that bucket so that it allows the combination of what they're placing in there and the rate of return to beat out that power of inflation to get a good growth on that account, on that bucket, and then ultimately be able to have a nice large bucket by the time they retire so that they could take out more and more and more dollars and not have that fear of outliving their monies. And this is where the accumulation or, or accumulation strategies come into play because the most common type of accumulation product or you know, for retirement would be an employer um, 401k account, which is just a, you know, it's, it's a type of retirement account that's established through an employer. And what they're saying is if you're working for a company, you could go and take a percentage of your salary, place it into a type of bucket like a 401k, your contributions will grow this bucket. And then dependent upon what your rate of return is that's tied to this bucket will also increase this bucket. And this rate of return is very important because when you're picking 401k options, what determines this rate of return side? And that has to do with your different funding options that you could choose. So these are your different mutual funds, stocks, bonds, you know, ETFs, whatever your, your array of options are available as long as these come back positive and you added dollars into that account, well, then your 401k is going to be larger than it was the, the previous day or the previous year. So why is that important when we're looking at a 770 account and what are the mistakes or what are the, the flaws with traditional retirement plans? And then how can a 770 account or 770 account really be beneficial for that individual situation? So just after years of reviewing financial publications and different strategies and stuff, um, what we did was we figured out that with an accumulation stage, in order for an accumulation stage to be really successful, they have to really focus in on four main quadrants. And some advisors use this as the acronym of time. The first one stands for taxes. So if you go and you have your monies that are invested into an account, like a type of retirement account, does it make more sense for those monies to grow tax-free and pull those monies out tax-free or to grow tax-deferred and be fully taxable on the back end? Because when we're looking at traditional 401k, I'm just going to use 401k account as this example, what happens is that's known as a pre-tax qualified retirement account. So just like the bucket, any contributions that are being placed into this bucket are getting a tax deduction meaning that if somebody makes $100,000 in a given year, let's say they threw $5,000 into their 401k account for that year and all else, everything else being equal, their adjusted gross income at that year, at the end of that year would be $95,000. They were pre-taxed, they got that tax deduction up front, and therefore that $5,000 that's being placed in there on the contribution side and whenever that rate of return comes back positive or, ne or negative, whatever that rate of return is that grows this bucket, that's going to grow tax deferred. And then when it comes time to retire, when they're in their 60s and they want to pull this money out, that's going to be fully taxable. So the government isn't just being nice and saying, okay, put your dollars into a 401k plan, get this tax deduction, everything's going to be rainbows and butterflies, you're going to have all this good growth, and we're never going to get a dollar back. There's an incentive to obviously get your tax deduction now, but the, their bottom line is to essentially fully tax you on those monies every time you take monies out of that account later on. So with a 770 account, what happens with those sorts of monies is you place them into those accounts when it's funded correctly, the cash value could grow tax-free, whatever's netted over from the contribution side grows tax-free, and therefore, the rate of return also that's placed in there grows tax-free. So then when it comes time and you're pulling it out properly, when you want to retire, those are going to be 100% tax-free. Um, it sounds great, but understand that 
the contribution is is really the trick with this entire account. The contribution and then also making sure that you're having a favorable contract with favorable rates of return uh, to make sure that you could have double compound interest working into that account. But when it comes on a taxation standpoint, you know, do you want something that's fully taxable or something that's going to be tax free later on? And it really just depends upon what the tax environment is at that time. So when we look at a chart of the top marginal federal tax rate, and this obviously stops at 2013, so it has to be updated further. You can just do a Google search on this. What it shows us is how high taxes used to be and where are tax rates right now. Well, you know, if you're a couple of years out from retirement, well, that might not be as, as big of a deal as if you're over 10 years out from retirement, 10 to 20 years out from retirement. And if those increase and you're in a high marginal tax bracket, that could be, you know, detrimental to your position. That could be detrimental to the amount of income that you're receiving later on, um, you know, from your types of retirement accounts. Case in point is, let's say if you pulled out $100,000, and it's from a fully taxable bucket in retirement. And let's say you're in a hypothetical 30% tax bracket. Well, you're going to be able to walk away with $70,000 of income because $30,000 had to go with taxes. It was fully taxable, the amount of monies, as opposed to a bucket that's going to be completely tax-free or, or a retirement account that's going to be completely tax-free. If, let's say, you're pulling out $80,000 that's tax-free, well, you're going to be able to walk away with $80,000, even though it seems like less dollars because of that taxation standpoint, how can you be most tax efficient during your accumulation strategy, meaning the dollars that are going into the dollars that are growing, and then when you're ready to pull those monies out, how do you utilize that most efficiently, most effectively on a type of accumulation and eventual distribution phase? The second aspect stands for I, which goes towards inflationary protection. So this is why it's important why individuals tend to place their dollars in something that's linked to the stock market is because they don't want to lose to inflationary risk or purchasing power risk. The way you could think of this is like a gallon of gas, you know, 20 years ago was a lot cheaper than today, a house, a car, all these different things. You have different expenses that might be fixed, but majority of, ex of expenses are going to increase with, the, with the, uh, the, the, the purchasing power risk and increase with inflation. And that's why rather than just set, uh, set aside a fixed dollar amount, hoping that a fixed dollar amount would just keep you know, compounding or just keep uh, accumulating, you want to make sure that you're effectively accumulating your dollars, you're contributing it into something, and making sure that that rate of return is at least beating out what the pace of inflation is. And the pace of inflation rule of thumb increases by about 2 to 4% in a given year. Some years you might not have any inflationary increase, you might have 4% the next year, so on average rule of thumb is about 2 to 4%. So, you know, that's a 401k can accomplish it, a traditional retirement account, um, you know, a, a type of 770 account that could accomplish it. But understand that inflationary protection is a is a major player, especially when you have those 10, 20, 30 years out from retirement or, you know, well into retirement, meaning that, you know, if you retire in the next 10, 15 years and then you're going to be living for another 20, 30 years beyond that, this is something that you want to have incorporated into your plan. The third important aspect is market losses. And how exactly can you try to restrict something known as your drawdown? And this is something that the world's most successful investors do, even when they're investing their money is in the market and they're investing their money is in risk of saying that the markets could go up, the markets could go down. One of the things that these individuals or these institutions do really well is they try to protect their ass. They pr try to protect their backside to make sure that if the market's going down, that they have a really good risk-adjusted return and that, that downward loss is not completely wiping out their accounts. And, you know, there's, there's a term that I use a lot, and I say in retirement, whether that's in your accumulation or whether that's in your distribution phase, I said large downward market losses could hurt far worse than gains could help you. And what I mean by that, if somebody loses 10% in one year, it's going to take them 11% gain the next year just to get back to break even. If somebody loses, as an example, 50% in one year, it's going to take them 100% gain just to get back to break even. So these are the large losses that I'm talking about is basically you're going to need that much more of a gain if you experience a large loss. And like if you had $100,000 that's currently sitting in your 401k account, and let's say your account dropped 50% the first year, and then it increased 50% the second year, well, on paper, your average rate of return, you know, a minus 50 and a plus 50, 
your average rate of return is going to be 0%. In reality, your account would still be sitting at only $75,000. You'd have a real loss of minus 25% or minus $25,000. So you're going to need a full 100% gain just to get back to that you know, $100,000 mark, just to get back to break even. So that's why you know, market losses are something that's so crucial that a lot of individuals just try to you know, leave their money in the market. They don't really have a good strategy, and it ends up hurting them, especially when they're trying to near out for retirement. Case in point is like a 2001 or 2008 when you had – you know, large portfolios lost anywhere between minus 30%, minus 60% on average. And, you know, that was that was a big hiccup. If you, you know, increase that number to a million dollars and this person takes a 40% hit that one year, that's $400,000 that is a lifestyle change, especially in retirement when they're nearing retirement. So that's something really important is to protect downward market loss. So when you're looking at it like a traditional 401k that's tied to market, you know, dealing with mutual funds, stocks, bonds, commodities, real estate, whatever that, that case might be, or IRA accounts, you have unlimited upside, but you also have an unlimited downside regarding those market losses. So unless you, you have a really good strategy to how to protect that, this is where a lot of individuals fall victim to this. A 770 account, um, the ones that I like to leverage are something known as IUL-based plans. They grow when the stock market that it's linked to, when the index increases and gains 0%, you have a 0% floor, meaning you are not susceptible to those downward market losses whenever that stock market index goes down. So what it essentially allows is the contributions to go in there efficiently, effectively, and then that rate of return to not come back and be a detriment to that type of bucket. And like what I mean by that is if you take a you know a given 401k in 2008, that you know they this individual was was placing dollars in there for years and years and years, was placing so many contributions. They got this side correct. It was this side, this rate of return that could be positive or could be negative. And when that came back negative, even something as small as a, you know, a 30% loss, that cut their portfolio in a third and, you know, essentially hurt them with trying to plan out to how they properly retire. With these types of accounts, you have a positive contribution side when set up correctly. And then that rate of return side will either be 0%, meaning that that, that negative is not going to hurt it, or it's going to be based upon whatever indexing strategy that is. And it's it's all specific towards carriers, towards companies and all of that. So I'm going to get into that in a little bit uh, a little bit later. So now it brings us to our fourth most important aspect, which are expenses. And I think this is probably the most important thing because if a 770 account is more expensive than a traditional retirement account, why would you go into this, this type of product line? And this is something where agents and advisors, they get this part wrong time and time again, is what they try to do is always talk about these three main benefits, and then they steamroll whenever somebody asks them regarding the expenses. It's really important if you ever been, if you are interested in a 770 account, or you're currently in the process of maybe getting set up, there's something that each agent could could go and offer or show you is something known as a cost of charges chart where you could see to the decimal point what your current charges would be, are currently and then what they're going to be each and every year going forward. So if you're seeing astronomical monies that are coming out of a 770 account and you know that those monies are a lot more expensive than what it would be going to a traditional retirement account, well, why would you go with that 770 account? It just doesn't make mathematical sense to do so. So that's the philosophy in getting set up in a 770 account. Um, my basic rules or my basic formula on this is as long as somebody is over 10 years out from retirement, as long as they have about 10 years worth of accumulation that they want to set up, um, that might be a nice sweet spot for them regarding the 770 account. Um, when they're before that 10 year mark, that's when the 770 account is typically going to be more expensive than a traditional play. And that's why I would typically recommend a traditional play. So, you know, please be mindful of that. And I'm going to show you, okay, how does a typical permanent life insurance policy work? And then what are advisors doing to maximize out the cash value component, get into a 770 account? And then what do we do to further expand on that cash value accumulation and further expand on the amount of leverage that you could utilize um, with that type of cash value as, a, as a, uh, a viable retirement supplement later on. 
So this is how a typical life insurance policy works. You might have seen this with other videos, um, but I'm going to correlate this to the conversation you know, regarding the accumulation phase. Each life insurance policy has something known as a death benefit that's attached to it. So with traditional life insurance, what happens is an individual is paying a premium dollar, and God forbid if they pass away, then this death benefit is going to get paid out to the beneficiaries, usually in the form of a lump sum. So if someone's putting in $1,000 into a plan and they have a $500,000 death benefit, this person makes one payment and then passes away, well, $500,000 now has to come off the life insurance company's books and get paid out to the beneficiary. So that's a large loss for the life insurance company. Any time that they're in risk to have these large losses, it's going to increase something known as net amount at risk, NAR. So, and case in point is like this is showing the dollars go into the plan majority of um, majority of the uh, of the red section is known as the cost of insurance and other expenses that has to get paid first to basically correlate to the death benefit to the net amount at risk and whatever's left over is going to go into a type of savings account known as cash value so this cash value is all the good things that I spoke about you know in, in this video of saying okay you have you could have tax free monies you could have inflationary protection no downward market losses you know expenses all these different things well, unfortunately, this is how majority of individuals or majority of agents, or should I say life insurance agents, set up plans. Because they understand that the larger this death benefit is, the higher the cost of insurance is, and the higher that their commission is going to be. And therefore, the cash value, yes, it is still growing with those different components, but it's not going to be favorable when you're comparing it on a retirement supplement uh, standpoint. When you're comparing the apples to apples with like a 401k or a Roth account, that's not even going to compare with being a, a viable option. So you have other agents that they say, okay, well, we're going to set up a cash value maximization plan for our, for our uh, clients. And what they do is they'll have that same dollar that goes in there, but instead of a $500,000 death benefit, they're going to reduce this down to a $100,000 death benefit. They're going to reduce this down to what the legal limits allow with the Internal Revenue Code 7702, 72E, and 101A that says that they could grow this money, this cash value tax-free. They could pull this money out tax-free, and they could also leave a tax-free death benefit. When someone's looking to utilize a 770 account, the cash value is going to be the most important thing, and the death benefit is going to be the least important aspect. You're not trying to get put into this plan for a death benefit play. Um, death benefit should be the absolute least of your concerns. Yes, you have a death benefit that's sitting there. Yes, it's beneficial, but you should try to beat the hell out of this death benefit as much as possible because you want to try to hone in on this cash value as large as possible. So with the death benefit being reduced down to $100,000, what do we notice? Well, the cost of insurance and other expenses also were reduced by you know about a fifth of the price of what it was with the $500,000 uh, death benefit. And therefore, this $100,000 has less dollars go to the cost of insurance and expenses because the risk is less to the insurance company, and therefore more money is being placed, is being netted as a contribution into that cash value. So all that happened was there was focus on that net amount at risk. So whenever we set up plans, and I say, okay, well, you know, other agents, they'll go and they'll try to set up these types of plans and they'll just, they'll just figure out this death benefit side, you know, tweak down the death benefit and call it a day. And that's still, you're still leaving a large portion towards cost of insurance and other expenses. So what we did was we really figured out, you know, what is this net amount at risk? What is the actual risk to the insurance company? And how can we cherry pick specific carriers and specific strategies to further reduce this net amount at risk and further increase the amount of cash value that's growing within that plan while still staying in compliance with these internal revenue codes? Because be mindful that the reason why you can't drop down this death benefit to like a dollar and put $1,000 in there is because this would be known as a modified endowment contract, and therefore, you're going to lose out on all those tax benefits that I mentioned previously. So if you have too small of a death benefit and too large of a cash value, well, then it's known as a modified endowment contract, and it works like a type of non-qualified retirement plan. So it's very important to strip down this death benefit to bare bones legal limits and then also make sure that this cash value is correlating with it as well. So when we set up our plans, we want it looking something like this. We're still putting in that thousand dollars, that's fine. The death benefit is still sitting at the lowest that it can be, but we have a different cost of insurance and other expenses that are associated with our plans 
what exactly did we do? Well, we honed in on a lower net amount at risk. With cash value plans, it's really important to make sure that this death benefit and this cash value are as close to each other as possible. This is known as the cash value corridor. So as, death, as cash value is increasing, we want death benefit to increase with it. If cash value goes down, we want death benefit to go down with it. So we want to keep these quadrants as, as, as or this correlation as close to each other as possible to make sure that you're paying the smallest amount of cost of insurance and other expenses and reduces the net amount at risk to the insurance company and make sure that in, in uh, return you're receiving the, the least amount of costs. So that's one aspect is making sure that that death benefit is as low as possible, then it's correlating. It has something known as a cash value corridor that increases when it goes up and decreases when it goes down, um, you know, each and every day, each and every year during your accumulation phase. Now, the second aspect that also shows a significant difference is this lower net amount at risk is majority of carriers, 99% of carriers and contracts, they offer this death benefit in the form of a lump sum. So what this says is this person puts in $1,000 and they pass away, hundred grand has to now come off the insurance company's books in the form of a lump sum. So if we're using not 100000 but let's just use a $300,000 example for, to help further explain this hypothetical situation. Um, and let's say this person threw in $1,000, they have a $300,000 life insurance death benefit. Well, 99.9% .9 of companies are with company A that says a lump sum. What we did is we found a company that has a patent pending design um, that pays this money out in the form of annuitization. And it's very sloppy handwriting. But understand that if they have $300,000 with company A and this person passes away, $300,000 now in that day has to get off of the company's books, off of insurance company A's books. With company B, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, we're going to not pay you $300,000 lump sum, but what we can do is pay you $10,000 per year for up to the next 30 years and make sure that, yes, you are still getting paid that death benefit. So what that does is it has a much, de a much lower net amount at risk with insurance company B is because they're able to hold on to those dollars for a lot longer, able to invest those extra dollars that they don't have to take off of their books, um, you know, invest that on the back end and make interest on interest on interest. Now, with somebody that's looking at this, you're saying, well, what the heck? I, you know, I lost out on that death benefit. My, my beneficiaries aren't receiving that in a lump sum, which is exactly my point to say, this is why the death benefit should be the absolute least of your concerns. There's two main components with this. First off, you want that death benefit to be as low as possible. Second off, you want this net amount at risk to be as low as possible. So therefore, even if it's getting paid out on an annual basis, you know, a 30th each and every year for up to those 30 years, that's completely fine because you are able to leverage that cash value. They're still receiving a tax-free death benefit, but in the back end, it's significantly lowering that net amount at risk. It's significantly lowering those costs. And when I'm saying significant, it's not just off of like 2 3% cheaper, you know, cheaper fees. It could be anywhere from 20% to 40% cheaper costs of insurance and other expenses when you're structuring it the right way with the correct carriers and the correct contracts, as opposed to just going blind into these type of 770 accounts. So if we're going back to that bucket aspect, everything I just explained was to add on more dollars from the contribution side. Remember, there's two sides to this accumulation phase. You have contribution side and rate of return. So if we're doing everything correctly and you have the most amount of dollars contributions going in there, well, you can't just call it a day. You also have to make sure that this is maximized as well. It's maximized in a very safe, efficient manner. And this is where we still cherry pick the carriers. We'd only find the ones that give us that annuitization phase on the death benefit. But then we also find ones that have really high either cap rates or really good indexing strategies. One in particular that we like to deal with, it actually has an uncapped index and a 0% floor. So if you go into that index and let's say the index gains 15% that year, you're going to have a plus 15% into your cash value on top of the contributions that you're placing in there. If let's say the next year that that index loses 40%, well, you're going to have a gain of 0% in there. So it's going up whenever that index goes up and gain 0% whenever that index goes down. 
the mistake that's made is individuals just go into this type of plan and they'll go into a plan with like really low cap. So they'll have like an S&P 500 with like a 10% cap and think that, okay, that's a good contract as opposed to other ones that might have 17% caps or might be completely uncapped indexes um, that make this rate of return much more favorable and overall grow your bucket at a much higher exponential um, you know, rate of return or an exponential growth than just, just falling victim to those lower cap limits. So that's the main takeaway is to make sure that you're sh stripping down those costs as much as possible. And second off, you're also finding really good indexing strategies and really good growth potential in there um, so that everything makes mathematical sense. But once again, we want to make sure that we're checking the acronym of time whenever we're looking at a retirement situation. So let's say if, yes, okay, the 770 account is more tax favorable than a traditional account, the inflationary protection will run them at the, both the same rates of return to make sure that it's uh, as close to an apples to apples correlation as possible. We're just letting them know that the 770 account is, you know, you have that 0% floor as opposed to the other account, which could go down when it's tied to market, uh, to, to downward market losses but most importantly, the expenses. If someone's trying to leverage this and their, um, you know, their, their account is too expensive, meaning that you know, one, one aspect might be that they're uninsurable or they're highly rated, so therefore you have a higher cost of insurance in there and other expenses, does it make more mathematical sense to go into a 770 account or does it make sense not to, to just you know, fully fund what you currently have through your employer? Um, another aspect is to do a blended strategy. And one of the things I didn't mention with like a typical 401k account is they offer something known as an employer or sorry, an employee match. So what that means is if someone's making a hundred thousand dollars and maybe they might be offered like a 3% match on their 401k account. So what this says is if this person contributes 3% into their 401k, their employer is going to give them 3% as well. So if they make $100,000 and they threw $3,000 in there, ultimately the employer is going to match 3%. It's an incentive to stay at that company, an incentive to invest your dollars into retirement plans, and therefore $6,000 is going to go into that contribution. If you're offered a match, you should not completely walk away from that 401k. You should limit the, it down. So you should say, okay, if I'm looking to put 10% of my money away for retirement, and I understand the good things mathematically it comes really it comes back really well with the 770 account. Maybe I'll reduce my contributions to my 401k to 3% to at least get that matching money. And then the other 7% is going to go into, you know, a 770 account only if that 770 account comes back most favorable. So like if you're only like five to 10 years out from retirement, the 770 account rule of thumb might not make the most sense for you. If you're going, you know, over 10 years, 10, 15, 20 years out from retirement, typically that's where you have a lot of really good compound growth potential in there. Uh, it allows us to strip away those costs as much as possible. And we show you to the decimal point where your expenses would be in this, where your expenses would be with your 401k account we do, or, you know, your employer sponsor plan or an IRA account, whatever that case might be. And we'll compare all across the board to make sure that all the math adds up. What we also do different is we have a calculator known as a retire sharp planning system where we let, where we get to depend upon the area that you're calling in from, um, you know, depend upon your situation, your age, all of that. We get to um, receive back over 1,200 plus results. What are the top three results for your situation? What is the number one recommendation that we would make? And then we take that number one recommendation and we show you on a scientific basis how much should you place into this type of plan or whether you should not place anything into this plan and maybe go into other avenues You know, uh, that's going to be most effective, most efficient. If you're in an accumulation stage, well, there's specific um, strategies to leverage in an accumulation phase to be most efficient. If you're nearing that road from retirement, well, then there's something known as a preservation and distribution phase that you want to make sure that you're not commingling a preservation and distribution phase with an accumulation phase. Each one has serves their own purpose. Each one has a specific set of rules to make sure that they're more efficient than the other. So, you know, depend upon what your situation is. 
um, you know, that's exactly what we're going to try to educate you on and make it very specific. But this could be leveraged really well. I do it for my own monies based upon my age, based upon the, the amount of dollars I'm placing in there. Um, some people watching this video say, what about Roth IRA? Roth IRAs are good or Roth 401ks are really, really good. Um, the problem is, is if you phase out of a Roth IRA, if you make too much money, you cannot contribute into a Roth IRA. It's known as a phase out provision. So you could be adding dollars into a Roth IRA, add dollars into a Roth IRA for a couple of years. All of a sudden you have those aspirations. You're making more money. It puts you over that limit. Both you and your spouse go over that limit. Well, now you can't contribute any more dollars into a Roth IRA. So that's where that hiccup kind of comes into play. Um, and that's why I didn't really focus the conversation on there. But we also show you comparisons. If you want to see, you know, Roth accounts or whatever, whatever that case might be, we want to make sure that we're as transparent as possible. And as long as the, you know, the science, the math comes back, that's when we'll give you the recommendation. If it doesn't come back most favorable, we're going to tell you something else. We're going to tell you don't, don't utilize this type of plan. So if you're interested in seeing if this would be beneficial for your exact specific situation, give our 1-800 number a call. 1-800-566-1002. We offer 24-7 customer service. You can give us a call mornings, nights, weekends, holidays, whatever the case may be. You're going to be speaking to an assistant, and then you say, you just reference this video, and we'll make sure that a specialist will be uh, either calling you back or be transferred directly to a specialist and go from there. Um, I think a more efficient, more effective way to do that, to set up an appointment, would be by going through our website. And when doing so, you could type in retiresharp.com. You could click on the link uh, within this, uh, you know, within this video, and... A retiresharp.com and a fossefinancial.com, they both go to the same place, but what you notice is a little icon pulls up on the right-hand side, bottom right, and it allows you to book your strategy session. So you actually get to see our calendar, and then when you schedule your, appoint your appointment, it's more locked in there, and then you just leave your little note, say, okay, I saw something on a 770 account, I'm interested, so we'll make sure that that specialist gives you a call you know, at that specific point in time. And please understand that I also handle a bunch of the appointments myself. So if you're calling in and you want to speak to me directly, just ask to speak directly to Derek or, you know, uh, basically make that note on the digital calendar and we'll make sure to, uh, you know, to, to have me contact you directly and, uh, and go from there. And I could explain, you know, more specifically to your situation what I've explained in these video, within this video and, and previous videos. But we're A plus rated on the Better Business Bureau. I believe it is because of our methodical process of education first through literature piece personalized videos, whatever that case might be. Um, but I want to thank you for watching this video. Please feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Retire Sharp, so you can have access to the most updated videos. Thanks so much, guys.